the next we're going to be talking about blood administration, and then after that we'll be talking about uh, our burn patients. So anyway, when you're talking about blood uh, administration, there's always a risk uh, for blood, you know, giving it to patients. Uh, it's fairly safe, but again, there are risks. And so you look at the risk-benefit uh, analysis. You know, is this the right treatment for the right patient at the right time? Uh, and things you need to look at is, do we really need to give this transfusion? Does a patient need it? What's our out-of-hospital time for the patient? Do we have blood products available? Do we have to wait uh, uh, a uh, pretty good long amount of time <coughs> before we can actually get it. Uh, can, is our patient type and crossed? And um, is this an appropriate transport and care of blood products? Because you can't just take your uh, units of blood and just put them on the, uh, the bench seat or the cot and uh, take them with you. You need to make sure that they're uh, kept cold. So why would we give uh, uh, blood? Well, we want to restore circulating blood volume because they're um, uh, leaking out somewhere. Uh, we want to improve the oxygen carrying capacity um, of, uh, for our patient. Uh, again, the red blood cells are carrying the oxygen and the hemoglobin, and if uh, they have, don't have enough blood, uh, they're not going to get the oxygen carrying components. And then there's specific coagulation components that may be missing on the patient <coughs> that we may need to give them. So there's a number of different uh, forms of blood. We've got the uh, whole blood, and that's fairly uncommon to give. Uh, to our patients, uh, and then we'll get into the reasons for that. Um, and one of the big things is it's uh, very expensive. It's a large amount of fluid, and uh, a lot of patients are worried about overloading them with fluid, so that would be one reason that you don't want to give the whole blood. Plus, most patients don't need whole blood. Uh, what they do need is red blood cells uh, because they need the oxygen carrying capacity. Uh, maybe they need some white blood cells and some platelets. Uh, there's cryoprecipitate and then other blood products that we're going to be talking about. So we need to consider the blood administration and the things we're going to look at is uh, are they having hemorrhagic blood loss as a result, result of trauma that we need to uh, replace some of this blood? Uh, are they having internal hemorrhage from uh, say some medical problems that uh, uh, we need to replace the blood? Uh, maybe they're anemic for whatever reasons. Maybe they're having some uh, uh, problems during surgery or post-op. There's some complications that are uh, caused uh, loss of blood for the patient. And then they can have uh, specific diseases. They could have leukemia or different type of cancers. They could be ane anemic due to uh, some type of illness. They could have coagulation disorders like our uh, 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 patients that have uh, uh, hemophilia uh, or some sickle cell patients. Most critical care transfer programs, if they're going for trauma patients or patients with uh, AAAs or thoracic dissections um, or bleeding due to a pregnancy, will carry uh, O negative blood uh, with them and bring it to uh, uh, the patient. Uh, this is especially true for helicopters. Uh, uh, rural hospitals may have limited resources also, and so we're going to need to bring the blood with it, uh, with us. Uh, another thing we need to look at is the time factor in our transport decisions. So if you're going at base at a hospital and it may take a while to get the blood product, well, can we get to that hospital and then come back by the time the blood gets there? Uh, so we need to look at that. Again, there can be some complications that we'll talk about uh, when they're transfusing our patients, transfusion reactions, which can be life-threatening for some of our uh, uh, patients. And so we need to weigh that there. Uh, again, care of the blood products while we're going to the patient and while we're caring for the patient. Uh, blood uh, before given to the patient needs to be uh, cold and blood products. Uh, there's strict uh, protocols and policies about that. Uh, and there's a limited amount of blood in the system, and so we need to be aware of that. That, you know, no, this patient really needs this blood, or, you know, the patient can um, wait uh, and they can maybe give them blood later, so they're looking at uh, that. So if you're going to be giving blood, you need to be skilled at uh, using it, <coughs> know when to use it, when not to use it, how to transport it, and how to uh, infuse it in the uh, patient. So if your system does uh, give uh, blood infusions, we need to be, uh, you need to be aware of, aware of that, so we need to be up on that. So there's the ABO blood system, and basically, 
on the blood, there's antigens. There's the A antigens and there's the B antigens, and that determines what type of blood we have and what our patients have. So a patient can be type A, can be type B, can be type AB, and type O. There's also an RH factor that's looked at and a human leukocyte antigen blood group, uh, which can also be looked at. And what's extremely important is uh, if you're going to type and cross a patient, which they will do in the, uh, in the hospitals, so they can give them type and cross blood if needed, is they need to identify the ABO group that the patient has so they can give compatible blood for that patient. That's the most important uh, step in typing and crossing uh, blood. Uh, if you give the incompatible blood to the patient, that can cause hemolysis, meaning uh, destroys the, uh, the red blood cells, and it can also kill patients, um, give them infections, and things like that, uh, what we're talking about. So the ABO method of blood typing identifies the antigens A and B. So again, you have a type A person, you have a type B person, a type e AB person, and you have the type O person. The type O person is known as the universal donor, and we'll get into that. So blood type A has an uh, antigen A on it, and in the plasma of the blood it has B antibodies. And so if a person's blood type A, they can receive blood type A or blood type O. They can receive um, somebody's blood that has um, B antibodies in it. A blood type B person has a B antigen on it, and they have A antibodies floating around. So they can uh, receive um, blood that has B and O antigens on it. Uh, blood pers a person with blood type of AB has AB antigens and has no um, antibodies in, in uh, the serum, so they can uh, receive all of the, uh, the blood types. And then last is type O blood. They have no antigens, but in their s serum, they've got A and B antigens, so they will receive, uh, can only receive type O blood. So patients that are receiving blood uh, can have uh, incompatible transfusion reactions, which we'll get into uh, just a little bit. So patients that receive blood types for which they have antibodies. So if their serum has um, any kind of antibodies in them, you don't want to give them blood that has those kind of antibodies or antigens on it because they will have a negative reaction uh, to the blood. Rh negative exposure. So patients are either Rh negative, Rh positive, and they can have a hemolytic, uh, where it again destroys uh, the hemoglobin reaction when they, uh, if they would get it on a second uh, exposure. Uh, and this comes into play in uh, our pregnant uh, females. And then there's a human leukocyte antigen, HLA. Um, these are patients that get blood from a lot of different donors, and they might develop a fe uh, fever to the, uh, uh, the blood that they're receiving. So we're really concerned, again, about the ABO incompatibilities there, uh, and they're very careful on that. And blood is always checked by at least two people. Uh, so there's no, no mistakes uh, uh, made. So again, the universal donor is type O, Rh negative blood, that's universal donor. And that can be given to uh, any patient. And it's good for that because some patients need blood fairly rapidly. And so in the trauma rooms, on helicopters, that's what you're going to be having for the uh, uh, patient. And then again, the Rh factors, it's found on the cell membranes. Most of the population is Rh negative. Uh, some people are Rh positive, but not, not very many. And then the HLA, it's found on the uh, cell membranes of uh, platelets, white blood cells, most tissue cells. Uh, and if you receive the, uh, if this patient receives the uh, donation from one patient, there's generally not a problem, but it's patients that uh, receive platelets from multiple donor donors who experience this fever uh, transfusion reaction. Um, and so that's the risk, again, getting lots of uh, blood components there. So whole blood, it has everything that uh, we've got in us. Um, you've got to be concerned that we could overload the patient with volume. So on your patients that have cardiac problems, uh, respiratory problems, that say congestive heart failure patients, uh, patients with MIs that don't have strong hearts, because uh, normally this is 450 to 500 mLs. And so you just have to watch that. And so that's why they're giving blood products more than whole blood. Uh, it starts breaking down about 24 hours after storage, and so there's increased potassium, decreased clotting factors, which can have an effect on our patient. Uh, they've got to be type and cross-matched uh, before it's given. Uh, generally, whole blood's not given until they've lost about 25% of the total blood volume. 
and it's used for blood volume expansion and, again, increasing oxygen carrying capacity. But generally, before they give them whole blood, they're going to use crystalloids, normal saline lactated ringers, or the blood components like uh, red blood cells, pack red blood cells, or uh, colloids. The pack red blood cells have all the characteristics of the whole blood except they uh, extract about 250 mLs of the pla uh, platelet-rich plasma. And so they'll get the same amount of RBCs as in whole blood, but you're giving them less fluid. And so this is good for uh, patients that you're concerned about uh, overloading them. Platelets, and these are different things that are in platelets. Uh, platelets are developed in the blood, in the bone marrow. Um, and you're going to give somebody platelets that has basically low platelets is one time you might give it, so that would be something like thrombocytopenia. Uh, if their platelets aren't working well, and that's fairly rare, but it is, uh, has happened, again, low platelet counts. They may be given uh, to patients that are having some extensive uh, invasive procedure or surgery, and they have a low platelet count. Or somebody in chemotherapy, which affects the platelets if they're in uh, DIC, where they're having problems uh, clotting, and then massive transfusion uh, uh, that patients are getting the alternate platelets with the, uh, uh, the blood transfusion. Uh, platelets, again, uh, things that come from platelets are fresh frozen plasma. It's uh, frozen, like it says. It's got to be thawed out. So it takes a while uh, to get. Uh, it's rich in clotting factors, and so it's used in patients, again, with blood loss, coagulation defects, deficiencies, if they want to reverse uh, warfarin or Coumadin that the patient's on and thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, again, low platelets. Uh, it does have a preservative in it, and so a risk is that they can have problems with uh, calcium. They can have high, uh, low calcium because it binds with the calcium. And if somebody has hypocalcemia, they can get prolonged QT intervals, uh, so we need to monitor the, their uh, ECGs. It can go into torsades or bradycardia. They may start complaining of muscle cramping. They can also have wheezing. They can seize, and they can have hypotension. So these are things you want to monitor. Uh, there's cryoprecipitate that might be given. This, again, this is a frozen blood product uh, taken from the plasma. And these are patients that have hemophilia, uh, hemophilia A, if they have a deficiency in fibrinogen. There's von Willebrand's disease, factor 13 deficiency, uh, because cryoprecipitate contains these, these different factors that these patients might need. Then there's albumin. Uh, something that's not used a lot, uh, but it is there. Uh, and you don't have to worry about ABO or RH compatibility. Uh, it's taken from pooled plasma. And there's a 5% solution, a 25% solution. If they're given a 25% solution, it produces five times its uh, volume from extravascular water. That is, basically draws f uh, this uh, extravascular fluid into the vascular space. Uh, and so it can draw a lot, so you don't need a lot of uh, fluid, but you've got to be careful because now you've got all this volume that's left, say, the extravascular s system. Now it's in the vascular system, so you've got to watch for heart failure. Uh, using a trauma, patients, burn patients, patients with bad infections, sepsis, and patients that uh, are in surgery. Plasma protein fraction uh, contains a lot of albumin and some globulins. And this, again, is used like albumin as a volume expansion in patients that are hypovolemic, uh, have uh, low protein levels because protein's in there, and these are shock and burn patients. And then synth synthetic uh, blood substitutes. Uh, research has been going on for many years for this because uh, it would be great if you have synthetic blood products. You don't have to worry about uh, contamination, um, infections, and things like that. Polyheme is one that's been studied for a long time. The advantage is this. You can store it. Uh, uh, for a year at room temperature, it's got a long shelf life. You don't need to type and cross match. Why do we want to give patients blood? So these are just a list of the different uh, reasons that uh, uh, we patient may need blood. Uh, and I met, already mentioned some of them. So a procedure, again, you, uh, they determine the patient needs blood. You want to have the uh, right equipment, so you have to have physician order. You have to have the blood product. Uh, Type and cross match if that's been done. Otherwise, you've got the packed red uh, uh, blood cells. Uh, so different blood products are available. Uh, you'd like an 18 gauge uh, or larger needle, though 20 gauge is acceptable. Uh, you want to have a filtered IV administration set uh, because you want to catch anything that might be in the blood, uh, even though the chances are fairly small. This is just another safety uh, thing. 
when I have normal saline, you don't want to use uh, lactated ringers or um, D5W, any of those, because it uh, will have an uh, adverse effect on the blood, which you don't want to have. So you've got the order to do it. You've got the right patient, the right uh, blood product, like it says here, uh, the right type. Again, you always have a second provider. Check it with you, an, uh, another paramedic, a nurse, a physician to make sure that the, uh, it's the right patient. Uh, you, also, you also like to have at least two IV lines in. And again, 18 gauge is great, but a 20 will work if you can't get an 18 in and then have a second IV line because uh, you can't give anything through the IV line that's uh, infusing the blood. Like I said, you want to use a 0.9 normal saline. If you would use D5W, it's going to cause hemolysis, meaning it destroys the um, hemoglobin. If you'd use lactated ringers, it would cause clotting, which is not a uh, good thing to happen. So we've got all the right stuff. We've got the right equipment. We want to get the right uh, baseline vital signs. It's good if you can get a temperature. Again, pre-hospital scene call. You're not going to take a temperature. You're going to be giving the uh, packed red blood cells. But um, in the hospital and some units, if they're transporting patients, will have a uh, thermometer. Because you want to get a baseline temperature because one of the reactions that you can have with our patients is they can start running a fever. So again, the two IV lines that you've got there and then monitoring the patient for the different reactions, which we'll be going uh, over, to, over uh, in just a little bit. And again, you want to keep the blood cold until you actually get it, uh, use it. In the hospital, they've got blood warmers that they will give on the patients uh, before giving the blood, especially if they're giving lots of it. Um, again, you want to make sure the, the tubing's all flush with your normal saline. You've got the blood connected to the uh, tubing. <coughs> That's running good, and then you start uh, Shut down the saline and run your uh, blood in. And you always want to start it slowly for at least the first 15 minutes and revital them, see how they're doing, and then you can speed it up, uh, again, depending on how sick they are. Now, if they're really crashing, really bleeding out, they will give the blood rapidly. But if uh, they're not, you know, it's best to give it uh, uh, slower, uh, especially uh, the first 15 minutes or so. Uh, you need to give the blood generally within four hours, that unit of, unit of blood, and most blood's going to go in a lot faster than that for us. Um, so our adverse reactions, we're looking for anaphylaxis, uh, hemolytic reaction, uh, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulopathy, any transfusion reaction, and infections, because bacteria can cause an infection in the blood. The signs of complications is they're going to uh, start running a fever above their baseline. They might have a hives, itching or a uh, flushed skin from allergic reaction. They could develop the swelling and soreness or hematoma at the venous site. Maybe it's infiltrated. Uh, if the kidneys get affected, they've got flank pain. Um, they can get tachycardic. They may get start getting wheezing and dyspnea, uh, again, from uh, anaphylaxis, allergic reaction. Uh, they could get hypotensive if they're having a, a bad reaction from it. If they go into DIC, they could start bleeding from uh, previous puncture uh, sites that had clotted off. You might see blood in the urine if they got a Foley catheter. And again, this is not going to be so much that we're going to see if we're giving blood uh, some of these things, so say a scene call. Uh, but it might happen, it's more likely to happen uh, on a patient you're transporting from one hospital to another. But some of these things can happen even in our, uh, uh, with our patients on a scene call. And then again, anaphylaxis, nausea, and vomiting uh, can start kicking in. So again, they can be allergic to some of the allergens that are um, in the blood. And so they have an allergic reaction. So histamine, um, you may need to consider epinephrine, uh, steroids, closely monitor them. And so it's the typical stuff you're going to see anybody that's having uh, allergic reaction, pruritus, urticaria, wheezing. They can have um, uh, edema in the face and lips and tongue, might get uh, chills, fever, nausea, things like that. Bacterial contamination, again, not likely to happen, but it can. Usually happens during uh, the phlebotomy uh, or something, uh, uh, the blood component got infected during the processing or preparation uh, or during the thawing of the blood components. Again, this is very uncommon uh, nowadays, uh, but they can have a rapid onset and they can uh, uh, die from it. Generally, if this kicks in, it's going to happen within the first 30 minutes or less. And the symptoms you're going to see, again, like some of the other chills, fever, vomiting. They can have an abdominal cramping. They might be having bloody diarrhea, um, blood in the urine. 
going into shock, going into renal failure, and going into DIC. Uh, it's real important to pick up on this real early. Again, we're monitoring our patients uh, fairly frequently, at least every 15 minutes. Uh, if this happens, uh, any of these bad things, you want to stop the transfusion. And there are protocols for uh, what happens if they have a transfusion reaction. If it's due to bacterial contamination, possibly, you want to save the blood product, save the tubing, um, and any equipment that was used, and that will go to the blood bank and they will investigate and see what uh, uh, may have caused it. Um, management, if they're going downhill, if she's getting chalky, we've got to treat for shock, fluid support, maybe vasopressors. Uh, they'd be put on broad spectrum antibiotics. They would uh, culture them to see what the, uh, the offending organism is um, and then put them on a specific antibiotic for that. And they uh, may need steroids. Febrile reaction. Again, there's some uh, bacteria um, uh, and antibodies that are in the uh, blood already of the patient. These antibodies and it reacts to the, uh, the donor WBCs. And again, uh, because it's febrile, the temp is going to have a temperature. It could be as high as 104. It could be having chills, headache, uh, facial flushing, might have some chest tightness, tachycardia, again, some flank pain. And they're going to need uh, antipyretics uh, for the fever, antihistamines uh, to counteract that. The hemolytic uh, transfusion reaction, it's caused because there was an ABO or RH incompatibility, or the donor wasn't compatible. Uh, they weren't cross-matched uh, properly, or the blood wasn't stored uh, properly. And there's an immediate uh, reaction, and there's a delayed reaction. The immediate reaction occurs soon after transfusion of the uh, incompatible RBCs, usually within minutes, because what happens is the RBCs are quickly destroyed. Uh, again, you can have abnormal bleeding from any uh, open uh, previous sites. They're going to be hypotensive. They're going into shock, chest pain, again, facial flushing, shortness of breath. Uh, chills and fever, again, the flank pain, they're going to go into renal failure, DIC again, uh, blood in the urine, and minimal urine output. Uh, supportive management, fluid management, vasopressors, uh, treat the symptoms. Uh, they be put on, uh, can be put on diuretics because they want the kidneys to keep uh, working, don't want to keep them uh, fail, so they want to help flush the uh, kidneys. So again, this happens fairly rapidly. A lot of these things happen fairly rapidly, and they're, they're real noticeable. It's not uh, subtle. Then you have the delayed hemolytic uh, uh, reaction. And these are patients that have already been sensitized uh, from a previous transfusion, maybe from a previous pregnancy or a transplant. Uh, they also have this antibody that is floating around in their body that uh, wasn't detected. This generally kicks in within three to seven days after the transfusion. So again, we're not going to see it if we're freshly given our blood. Uh, but these are patients that we might be transferring from uh, one hospital to the next. Uh, the signs and symptoms are generally mild. They can, may have some uh, mild fever, chills, uh, and jaundice. And they tend to do all right. And there's something called plasma protein incompatibility. Uh, it's due to incompatibility of immunoglobulin A. Uh, signs and symptoms, abdominal pain, diarrhea. And they never found out why they might have diarrhea, but diarrhea is one of the things that they may have. Fever chills again, again with flushing, shortness of breath, hypotension are the two uh, big things we're concerned about. Um, oxygen, IV fluids, vasopressors, and steroids, again, depending on um, what they're looking like. And other causes, um, again, circulatory overload. Uh, we're we need to be real concerned about in our patients that have cardiac and pulmonary disease because uh, they can go into congestive heart failure. Again, they're generally not given whole blood. Packed red blood cells are the things that uh, are going to work uh, the best for them, the less chance of uh, overloading them. Um, bleeding tendencies, again, we already mentioned some of the bleeding uh, that they can get from some of these reactions that they're having there. Uh, hypocalcemia. Uh, some of the products have citrate in them, and they can get uh, citrate toxicity from uh, large amounts of blood products to be given too quickly um, and too, uh, too rapidly, and a lot of them, because the citrate, again, binds with the calcium. Uh, patients that are hypothermic are more likely to run into problems with this, or if they've already got elevated potassium levels. Um, what will happen is they will have different arrhythmias, they become hypotensive. Uh, they may, early on, they might start complaining of uh, muscle clamping and some nausea, and then they may have vomiting, 
and then you can also seize uh, with this. If they um, have potassium intoxication, that's basically high potassium levels because, again, potassium can get released. Um, there's high potassium levels that are in stored plasma, and so they're getting this, and now the, the potassium level is going up. Or they could have uh, high potassium to begin with, but the uh, RBCs, they start getting hemolysis and the hemoglobin there. So anytime high potassium, you've got the tall peak T waves, you, they can become bradycardic. Uh, they can go into cardiac arrest, an early sign might be muscle twitching. Uh, they can have diarrhea, and they can have uh, minimal urine output. So you look on the monitor, and they've got uh, peak T waves. Uh, they're having some of these other symptoms. You want to get a 12 lead. And to counteract this high potassium, they may be given k exhalate um, Albuterol will temporarily force the uh, potassium into the cells. Uh, and give Lasix to help get rid of some of the potassium. B50, insulin also helps drive the, uh, uh, insulin helps drive the potassium back in the cells. And D50, because you're giving insulin, uh, you don't want to drop the blood sugar too low. Sodium bicarb is also uh, used sometimes, and calcium. We can make our patients hypothermic. So you've got a severely injured trauma patient, hypotensive, tachycardic, I might be losing large amounts of blood, and you're pouring in large amounts of blood uh, into this patient. If it's cold, they're going to get hypothermic. And again, trauma patients don't do well uh, with hypothermia. And so in the hospital, they will have their blood warmers, and there's different manufacturers out there, and warm the blood uh, going into the patient. If they're getting hypothermic, it's like anybody that gets uh, cold. They're going to have chills. They're going to start shivering. And as it goes along, if uh, we don't notice it, they're going to start getting bradycardic. Things are going to start slowing down, and they're going to eventually end up going into cardiac arrest. So we need to monitor their, uh, their temperature. Uh, so the management, best management is uh, prevention. So warm blood, warm packed red blood cells. Again, pre-hospital a little more difficult, so most units don't carry that. But just be aware that that can happen. Uh, and then just try and keep the patient warm um, the best that you can uh, while you're in route with the patient. So again, the big thing with our blood administration is we need to look at the risk benefits. Uh, we need to be cautious on that and ask yourself, do the benefits uh, outweigh the risks for our patients? Uh, and that's key. And then just doing close monitoring of our patients until we uh, get them to the uh, hospital and transfer over the, uh, the patient to the uh, uh, the hospital.